Well, good morning. Uh, on the Sunday morning, trust you all are well in every way. And um, just a few announcements before we before we get going this morning. Uh, Matt is going to be doing his second uh, message of the series uh, leading up to Easter. Kind of really looking forward to that. Um, just a few a few things that uh, we can we can look out for. If you um, if you're on Facebook, um, then on the NCMI Facebook page or New Covenant Ministries International. There's two. I think the one is a page and the other one's a group. I'm not too sure, but um, uh, you can go on there and um, there's devotions and encouragements. Um, and teachings almost daily from uh, from leaders around the world, usually about five to ten minutes long only, very short. Um, so Tyron does some, and uh, friends of ours in South Africa, and there's people in Chicago and so on. So there's people all over the world that uh, that are doing those devotions every day. So that might be a good idea just to uh, um, just to do on a daily basis, especially if you are at home at the moment. And it's a short message, something to look out for. And uh, yeah, then also what happens is that you'll be connected with uh, people around the world. Uh, we're not alone on this, and so uh, and it's people that we know. I think that's also that's also pretty key. It's people that share values with us, and uh, people that understand how we see the Great Commission, um, how we are working to know Jesus and to make Him known. And uh, so it'll be pretty much along those lines. But very much uh, encouragement. I know that there was one post this morning by. Uh, Marcus Herbert, who leads a church in Johannesburg, and uh, it was just praying together uh, through this time. So go on there. If you have any questions about online giving, um, if you have an old bulletin, uh, it'll give you details. The paper bulletin will give you detail on how to do that. Uh, otherwise, get hold of Anne at the office on Tuesday, and uh, she'll be able to, to talk you through that. Alternatively, you can just uh, drop off your your tithe and so on uh, in the mailbox. It is locked. You can just drive past, do a drive-by posting of tithe. That's that's quite amazing. And so uh, you can you can do that. Uh, talking about the office, um, the office is open and it's closed. Uh, so so we are here working. There is stuff to be done. Uh, you know, I'm personally working on stuff for a for a church planners course that was that's hopefully going to be happening next year. Uh, together with uh, leaders from around Canada, there's stuff that we need to do. Uh, it's a good time to catch up, and so, but it's it's not open just to just to come and hang out. Um, I think I think the social distancing thing needs to be applied. And uh, so, if you're here to do some work, and uh, you might see Gary's car here, and he's out the back working in the shed or so on, um, then there's a reason for that. Um, so we're not saying we don't want to be welcoming, but we also want to be wise. Just give us a call. Let's see what uh, see what we can do to help you. All right. So next week uh, we'll be doing communion together. So before Matt preaches, we will have communion. So uh, just a reminder, I will remind you a week again, just to have uh, some some juice and some uh, some bread available, so that we can have some communion together online. You can have that in your in your homes. All right. So we're going to do something a little different this morning before Matt comes up. And uh, so Tony's come along. He's brought his he's brought his guitar, and uh, he is he is like way over there. And we're all trying to keep away from each other, trying to keep our distance. But he's going to be coming over here. We're going to be uh, singing a song uh, that we that we all know about the goodness of God, and uh, very appropriate for this time. He's also going to read a scripture and uh, sing along. Uh, maybe you think you've got a rubbish voice and you don't like to sing loudly. Well, you're at home now, so you can sing as loud as you like. And uh, Tony, Tony will lead us, uh, lead us in that song. All right, Tony, why don't you come and take a seat here, bud? Good morning, everybody. And uh, this is an honor for me to be able to sit here today and lead worship. And uh, I just want to say that you know, there's times when I go through a bunch of stuff, and you know, we're worried about the world and. The best thing to do is just to praise God, just give him glory for who he is, because he sits on the throne always. And the scripture, it's uh, 121 Psalms, and it says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? But my help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And so, and so we just need to give him praise this morning. I love you, 
Lord. And your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, and I will sing the goodness of God. You have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good. In every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. Like no other, I know you as a father, and I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been. said, I hope you are all doing great in this time. Thanks, Tony, for that. That was awesome. Man, I miss worshiping as a group together, but I'm so glad that we can get together like this, even if it is a little strange. Well, today is part two of my series called The Passion of the Christ, and it is my privilege to be talking with you today about it. I'm going to jump right in with uh, a recap of what we looked at last week. Now, remember that what we were looking at is the most important uh, story there is. And as Christians, we believe that this matters more just as much today as it did when it occurred 2,000 years ago. We looked at uh, Jesus when he had his final supper with his disciples and his final instructions to them before he knew he would be taken away. Uh, he washed their feet and told them to love each other in the same way, humbly and caring for each other. We looked at Peter and the mistakes that he made and 
how he condemned himself, but Jesus did not. In Jesus' eyes, his mistakes did not disqualify him. Also, our mistakes do not disqualify us in Jesus' eyes. And also, a point that many of you seem to really connect to was when we looked at Jesus in the garden and how he sweat blood, he was so scared. And what that means for us is that to fear is not sin because Jesus feared and he never sinned. And what matters the most in situations like that in our own lives is not that we're afraid, but what we do with that fear, who we take that fear to, uh, how we treat others and ourselves in that fear. Do we take that fear to God like Jesus did? Now, the sermon today, just a disclaimer for everyone watching and listening. I will get descriptive in what I'm going to talk about what Jesus went through, which means it's going to become gory for some. Uh, if you have kids in the room with you or if you're squeamish yourself, uh, act accordingly however you think is appropriate. Uh, before jumping in, I want to pray quickly. Father, may the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth this day be pleasing to you, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. We begin with Jesus captured by the guards of the chief priests and the teachers of the law. These men uh, to the Jewish people are known as Pharisees. Now, they secret Jesus away and they set up a corrupt, rushed trial in the middle of the night, specifically just to condemn him, not to judge him fairly. Men come forward that they have selected beforehand to give false testimony about Jesus and to lie about the things that he said and did. But they can't even get this right. All their testimonies don't line up. Finally, uh, they ask Jesus under oath if he thinks himself to be the son of God. Jesus says, I am. And the, the Pharisees consider this more than enough evidence to condemn Jesus to death. They deem it blasphemy. This trial ends with Jesus spat on, mocked, and beaten. Before we go any further, I want to look at this one question. Did the Pharisees think themselves bad men? Did they think themselves evil men? Were they like Ursula or Jafar from a Disney movie? loving to do evil, being the pantomime villain? I don't think so. I think they thought themselves justified in what they did. I think that they were actually blinded to their own evil and their own deeds. I think they had fallen from what they were initially meant to be. They were meant to lead their people to God. Instead, they were condemning his son. Jesus uh, talks about the Pharisees in Matthew. Matthew 23, 27, 28 says this. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Full of hypocrisy and wickedness. I think that rotted them from within. It blinded them. And ironically, put them on the exact opposite path of what they were supposed to do. So what does this mean for us? All of us are imperfect. All of us are hypocrites at one time or another. It's just true. Does this mean that we ourselves have to be perfectly consistent in all we say and then do? 
or we are liable to become like the Pharisees? I don't think so, but this is a warning. Uh, to help clarify what I'm talking about, we're going to look at Luke. As Luke records Jesus speaking to his disciples. Luke 18, 9 to 14 says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, these are disciples, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, at this time, tax collectors are considered, quite frankly, the scum of the earth. They, their job is to take money from the Jewish people and give it uh, to their rulers. And uh, so this is two opposite ends of the spectrum in society at this time. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Do you see what he's doing here, right? This Pharisee is not actually showing gratitude to God. He's not actually praying or worshiping God. He is taking the opportunity to brag about how amazing and holy he is compared to everyone else. Luke tells us, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This tax collector, unlike the Pharisee, he was humble. He was asking for help. Luke again says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus is saying that that tax collector was exalted this day because he went to God. He says that that Pharisee that day was humbled. So, arrogant, selfish pride blinded the Pharisees. They thought themselves justified. And because they thought themselves justified, they thought they were above it all and could actually say one thing and do another. They used power and position to justify their hypocrisy instead of embracing their purpose to point their people to God. That's a lot of peace. Let me say it again. They used power and position to justify their hypocrisy instead of embracing their purpose to point their people to God. They were strutting around and preening in their self-earned holiness. They forgot that holiness and righteousness alone comes from God. In the parable that Jesus says here, that Pharisee's delusional pride was a self-laid trap beneath his feet that he did not see. A sinner's penitent plea for mercy, knowing that he could not be worthy on his own, was a step towards his salvation. Now, does this mean that we can never take pride in anything? No. What it means is that we have to examine the foundation of our pride. We can and should take pride in a job well done, a first place achieved, and the knowledge that Christ has clothed us, clothed us in white and made us princes in his kingdom. However, when your pride is solely based on being better than others, your foundation is on shifting sand. So, friends, Unlike the Pharisees, we need to be honest with ourselves about our own shortcomings and hypocrisy, not stand on our own pride. We blind ourselves if we do not. However, we cannot stay there or we will be crushed under our own lack. From that place of honesty, we must be like the tax collector and say, God, help me. I can't do this myself. I need 
you. So, back to the story. The Pharisees take Jesus then to uh, the Roman governor of Palestine at this time, and a huge crowd gathers. Now, Rome actually rules the whole Mediterranean, and uh, the Pharisees are taking Jesus to the man that runs this land. The governor did not think that Jesus was guilty. He could see that the Pharisees were envious of Jesus, and the Roman governor wanted to release him. But the Pharisees were inciting the crowd to crucify Jesus. The governor, not wanting a riot or a rebellion on his hands, gave in to the crowd's demand, sadly. Now we're going to read and pick it up in Mark 15, 15b to 20. The governor had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they let him out to crucify him. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing is that I'll be reading those same scriptures again, but I will be reading it alongside a commentary of an article titled Medical Description, The Flogging and Crucifixion of Jesus. I'm doing this because sometimes scripture and the words in it seem distant. They don't have as much meaning as they could for us. What I want to do here is that I want to make these words here as vivid and realistic to us as possible so that we can understand as far better what Jesus went through. Why do I want to drive home this point? Jesus did not have to endure this. He chose to. Why? Because this is how he would save you and me. And why did he do that? Because he loves you and me. And as we're about to find out, if his love is based on the amount of pain he went through, it is a lot. It is a lot. Mark 15, 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The Romans, commenting, the Romans first stripped the victim and tied his hands to a post above his head. The whip was made of several pieces of leather with pieces of bone embedded near the ends. Two men, one on either side of the victim, usually did the flogging. The Jews mercifully limited flogging to a maximum of 40 stripes. The Romans had no such limit. The following is a medical doctor's description of the physical effects of flogging. The heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again across Jesus' shoulders, back, and legs. At first, the heavy thongs cut through the skin only. Then, as the blows continue, they cut deeper in the subcutaneous tissues, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. Finally, the skin of the back is hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. It is not surprising that victims of Roman flogging seldom survived. Okay, we are just getting started. Mark 15, 17 to 18. 
They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Quote, the crown was made of some kind of prickly plant, such as abounds in Palestine. This they pressed into his scalp. Again, there must have been copious bleeding because the scalp is the most vascular areas of the body. Mark 15, 19. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. Quote, the mocking was followed by further physical violence. The blows hitting his head from the staff drove the thorns more deeply into Jesus' scalp and caused even more profuse bleeding. They also kept spitting on him. Mark 15, 20. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they let him out to crucify him. At last, tiring of their sadism, the soldiers tore the robe from Jesus' back. The fabric had probably stuck to the clots of blood and serum in the wounds. Thus, when it was callously ripped off, it caused excruciating pain, just as when a bandage is carelessly removed. Jesus' own clothes were put on him. Mark 15, 24, and they crucified him. Jesus is thrown, thrown backwards with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrist. He drives the heavy square wrought iron nail through the wrist, deep into the wood. Quickly, he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow flexion and movement. The cross is then lifted into place. The left foot is pressed backward against the right foot and with both feet extended, toes down, and nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails and the wrists, excruciating fiery pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails and the wrists are putting pressure on the median nerves. As he pushes himself upward to avoid the stretching torment, he places the full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, he feels the searing agony of the nail tear, tearing through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. At this point, another phenomenon occurs. As the arms fatigue, Cramps sweep through the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward to breathe. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but not exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one small breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in life-giving oxygen. To be clear, he is slowly choking to death because he cannot lift himself up to breathe. Hours of this limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, intermittent partial asphyx asphyxiation, Searing pain as tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then another agony begins deep, crushing pain deep in the chest of his pericardium or the area around his heart. Slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. This is an insane and horrible form of torture. And just to reiterate, Jesus willingly chose to do this for you and me. Now, Jesus spoke 
while he was hanging on this cross. And I had always known that what he had to say was important because he's Jesus, but understanding more of what he was going through, he, yeah, understand more of what he was going through, what he actually had to say while on that cross adds so much more weight and significance because it was hard to even breathe and every single breath took pain and to speak and and to say words took even more breath. So to put in that effort, whatever he did say, must have really mattered. And what we're going to do now is that we're going to look at uh, different things that he had to say. First, Luke tells us that Jesus said these words to the Roman soldiers. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Now understand this. Jesus is using his dwindling strength to pray for the men that are murdering him. This is ridiculous. This makes no sense to how we naturally think. It's hard to comprehend this level of grace and love. Also, interestingly, uh, Stephen, one of Jesus' disciples, a few years after this, uh, is the first disciple to be uh, murdered for preaching Christ, the first martyr. And Stephen says much the same thing uh, for the men that kill him. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And this is the legacy of Christian martyrs throughout the millennia from Jesus and Stephen onwards that these men and women pray for those that wish to murder them. It, I don't have enough adjectives for it. Now, Jesus is not crucified alone. He's crucified with two uh, criminals and it's said that they're placed on either side of his own cross. And they spoke to Jesus. Luke 23, 39 to 43 says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus can't stop comforting people. Also, I think there's a good lesson to be learned here from the repentant thief. See, this, this man, he could not save himself. He could not stop himself from dying. He could not control his situation, but he could choose how to react to his circumstances. Unlike the first thief who decided to leave this world in bitterness, hurling insults at Jesus, this repentant thief decided to respect Jesus and my, I say that, you know, I deserve this, but you do not. So what does that mean for us? It means that we cannot always choose our environment we find ourselves in. Either one given to us by an outside force, like how this coronavirus is affecting the world, or a situation of our own making from our own poor decisions in the past. But 
as long as there is breath in our lungs. We always have a choice of how we are to react to the situation. So I ask you, how are you going to react to your situation today? Matthew and Mark both record Jesus saying this sentence near the end. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this sounds despondent. This does not sound uplifting or inspirational from Jesus. But what Jesus is doing is that he's actually quoting the first line from a Jewish hymn that many would have known at this time, uh, a hymn that we know too, uh, called Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 has many depressing lines, like the one that Jesus said there, but it also has other ones too. Uh, to give you an idea of what the hymn is, I'm going to read the first five verses. Psalm 22, 1 to 5. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. For me, this is something of a parallel to what we looked at last week when Jesus was in the garden sweating blood. Jesus is saying, I am scared. I do not feel you here at the moment. I need you. I'm hurt. But you know what? I will still worship you. I will still praise you. I will still trust you, despite it being darkest night. Now, John records Jesus saying at the end, it is is finished and with his final breath jesus gave up his life now the question is what is finished also usually it's not a good idea to rewrite the bible but i think jesus could just as correctly and significantly have said it is begun. It is begun. So, all of this and more, it is finished, it is begun, we will talk about next week in part three of this series, The Passion of the Christ. And we will end it with the culmination of this amazing story on Easter Sunday. So, to recap, the Pharisees, they did not think themselves bad men. I don't think so. I think that they were blind. And I think that they are a warning to us that we must be honest with ourselves about our own shortcomings and go to God honestly and say, God, help me. I need help. I need help and not strut around in our own supposedly self-earned pride. And to understand that Jesus loves us so much, he chose to go through pain that I can't imagine for us. And that today we have the opportunity to react to our situation the way that we can and should and the way that Jesus wants us to. So before I leave you, I would like to pray for you. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for every single person that is listening to my voice. 
you love them more than they could ever know. I pray for a realization, a deepening of that love that you have for them. May the Father bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn towards you and give you peace in these strange times. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. And I will see you next week. Goodbye.